Well, hello everyone and welcome uh, to a panel on transnational suffrage. I'm Professor Sarah Crabtree and I'm delighted to welcome two guests today um, to talk about a really fantastic recent um, book. The first is uh, to my left and the Brady Bunch screen is uh, Professor Sarah Curtis. Um, she's a professor of history here at San Francisco State University specializing in 19th century France. Her first book, Educating the Faithful, published in 2000 with Northern Illinois University Press, examined Catholic primary education in 19th century France. Her second book, published with Oxford University Press in 2012, Civilizing Habits, followed three women missionaries who traveled to the American frontier, the Mediterranean basin, and the French, African, and Caribbean slave colonies in the first half of the 19th century. Professor Mona Siegel, whose wonderful book we'll be talking about today, is a professor of history at Sacramento State University. She has received numerous fellowships, including the National Endowment of the Humanities, and published widely in edited volumes and journals, including Gender and History, French Historical Studies, and the Journal of Modern History. Her first book with Cambridge University Press was published in 2004, entitled The Moral Disarmament of France, Education, Pacifism, and Patriotism from 1914 to 1940. And we are here today to talk about her second book, published this year with Columbia University Press, entitled Peace on Our Terms, The Global Battle for Women's Rights After the First World War. So thank you both for joining us. Um, uh, Mona, this book highlights the transnational dimensions of suffrage and women's rights in the years immediately following World War I. I wonder if we could just start out with kind of a general introduction to this, to your work, who these women were, what they wanted, and how they went about it. Absolutely. Well, thank you, uh, Sarah and Sarah, for <laughs> inviting me today. Mm -hmm. I have to say, I, you know, as long as I have the stage for a second here, that I have read both of Sarah Curtis's books that you mentioned there, and they're both wonderful. So it's always a pleasure to talk about history with her. Um, Peace on Our Terms, uh, the book we're talking about today, is a book that I want to say kind of reached out and grabbed me and demanded to be written. Um, it wasn't a book that I was kind of going and looking to try and dig out. It was a book that came together and just, to me, screamed out to be written. It is a story of women's global activism at a particular moment in time, actually a particular year in history, which is to say 1919, at the very end of the First World War and at the time of the peace negotiations that followed when global statesmen had gathered together in Paris, crafting the new liberal international order that would define global politics for the century that followed. And my book examines women from all over the world who also seized upon this moment, seeing in it a um, truly unique opportunity to advance women's rights both at home in their own countries and on the global stage. So the book proceeds in um, six chapters that move chronologically through the year 1919, but move geographically through space. So it opens in Paris with women, Western uh, suffragists primarily, who organized in order to try and influence the outcome of the peace negotiations. It remains largely in Paris, although elsewhere in chapter two, looking at African-American and Pan-African female activists who were seeking to advance both racial and gender equality in Europe in 1919. Uh, chapter three moves to Egypt and moves on to March when Egyptian women took to the streets demanding both national and individual sovereignty in Egypt. Uh, it then moves back to Europe, to Zurich, where women from both the Allied and Central Powers, so former enemy nations, came together, rejecting the Versailles Settlement uh, as the groundwork for peace and stability and demanding a feminist peace all the way back in 1919. Uh, chapter five uh, looks at Egypt, both back um, in Egypt itself and the May 4th movement, but also through the eyes of a remarkable woman by the name of Sume Chung, who was a Chinese delegate to the Paris Peace Conference and the only woman in the world to enjoy that uh, distinction in 1919. And then it concludes both in Europe and in the United States where labor feminists and their allies gathered in order to try and put 
women workers' rights on the international agenda at the end of World War I. Yeah, I mean, it's just so fantastic. And the scope of the people involved and the places that they go. Um, and it just, it puts suffrage in such an international context. And, you know, here in the United States and this um, conference that we're hosting virtually this year about the 100th anniversary of suffrage, you know, the US story is so often seen in isolation. And I just wonder, you know, these, the American women in your study, they travel all over the world, they meet all of these people, they're at all these important international movements. And why do you think that that's not more of the story? Uh, it's an interesting question. And I have to say last spring, just before and after we all got sent home, I was teaching a class on the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment at Sacramento State. And so we were largely looking at American history mm -hmm. together and reading both classic uh, stories of the American women's suffrage movement, like Eleanor Flexner's from you know, 50 plus years, 60 plus years ago now, um, as well as more contemporary accounts. and. You know, all of them recognized that there was an international women's suffrage movement, an international women's suffrage association. And they make a nod to the fact that, for example, Carrie Chapman Catt, who was such an important leader in, among the moderate suffragists in the United States, was a founder and president of the American, uh, the International Women's Suffrage Alliance. So the idea that there was an international movement out there is recognized, but um, it's never really interrogated and certainly never put center stage. And also I've come to realize that because it tends to appear to talk about, for example, Kat's leadership in the movement, it really forwards this idea of American exceptionalism, right? Mm -hmm. That American women somehow were always at the forefront of suffrage and women's rights movements and other nations followed. And that is both untrue, even though there were women, who, uh, in, I'm sorry, American women who played an important role, um, but it's also misleading in dangerous ways um, because it really underplays the kind of ground up feminism in so many other parts of the world. And um, one of the things that I demonstrate in my book, for example, is that in 1919, in part because American suffragists were so focused here at home on you know, pushing the 19th Amendment over the, um, over the finish line, that in fact, they missed out on the most dynamic moment in the development of global feminism, which was occurring in Europe, which is the single most important place in the world where this new international order was, was taking form. And so it meant that, um, that European suffragists and suffragists like French suffragists that Sarah Curtis and I study, who are seldom seen at the forefront of much of anything, at least in this time period when it comes to feminism, were in fact um, seizing the moment because it was all happening in their backyard. And then the other interesting fact that Sarah Crabtree, you referred to a moment ago, is that there were American suffragists who came to Europe in order to try and demand women's rights, not just as a national right, but as an international and human right. Um, but the American suffragists who tended to be participating internationally at this moment were those who had been most marginalized in the American suffrage movement. And um, you know, three groups of women in particular who tended to see international activism as even more important than national activism at this moment include um, pa radical pacifist women like Jane Addams, um, who saw women's right to vote as tied to forwarding a very different type of national and international policy. It included labor feminists uh, like Rose Schneiderman, for example, who I talk about in my book, who were dedicated and actually dedicated years of their lives to advocating for suffrage. But the reason for doing that, they, they believed, was to um, challenge and change women's exploitation as workers. And they knew that if that only happened in one country, well then exploited, exploitative labor would just be sent abroad. And so those changes really needed to be made internationally. And then finally, African-American women who understood you know, viscerally how much their uh, discrimination and limitations in their lives were linked not just to sex, but also to race. And that this was tied to a global system of white supremacy and imperialism that they were dedicated to helping to topple.
Okay, thank you. Um, I want to ask sort of a follow up question. Before that, I also want for the our viewers to actually show a copy of your book here. So they'll recognize it when they see it at a bookstore or website near them. Um, it is a wonderful book and I'm also so impressed with the scope. I think European historians barely ever go out of the uh, national boundaries and certainly not out of the continental boundaries. And here you are um, really doing global history and, it's, and it is so exciting. Um, so um, one of the themes of the conference is the way in which um, uh, the privilege of white, middle-class, native-born uh, Protestant suffragists uh, cause them to ignore or not build on uh, coalitions with uh, women of color, working women, immigrant women, and so forth. And I think one of the things that your book does is show the ways in which that um, dynamic also is global, right? So could you talk a little bit about the way in which um, the the relationships between uh, women in the United States, privileged women in the United States and Europe, and how they interact, or what these other dimensions of global feminism are outside of the West. Sure. So, I mean, on the one hand, still looking at the West, but kind of looking at the problems within, um, or the I should say the limitations within uh, Western feminism more broadly, is of course that racism and classism are not uniquely American phenomena, uh, not in society at large and not in the feminist movement. And so, um, you know, the women who were most effectively able to act on their interests and demands, which meant at the time capturing the ear of powerful men because they held the reins of power, were largely white, wealthy, or at least middle class women. And that was as true in Europe um, as it was in the United States for the most part. And so we see lots of examples in the aftermath of World War I of Western feminists more broadly, um, not just asserting their own rights on the global stage, but asserting the right to speak for all women. Um, uh, this was true, for example, my chapter one of my book looks at a very important meeting uh, known as the Inter-Allied Women's Conference, which was the primary lobbying body for women um, at the Paris Peace Conference. And these were women who wanted suffrage, among other um, women's rights, to be um, kind of codified in this new international system that was giving birth to the League of Nations and eventually the United Nations as well. And when they um, did uh, gain an audience with uh, Woodrow Wilson and David Lloyd George and George Clemenceau and all these really powerful uh, male uh, heads of state, they spoke on behalf of all women. And they, they even said, you know, we recognize we don't have a mandate to uh, define the interests of women from um, other parts of the world and from the colonial world. Nonetheless, we think we would be remiss if we didn't address issues uh, common in, uh, in these other parts of the world. And so they pointed to things like um, sex slavery and uh, uh, child betrothal and other issues that they wanted the international government, the new League of Nations, to take up. Uh, one of the things that I say, you know, I point out that the problematic nature of this in my book, in part because actually many of these women were, at least the elites among them, were gaining both the knowledge and the voice and the stature to make some of these demands on their own. Um, so um, the problem wasn't so much in recognizing the scope of the problems, because women in the Middle East, women in Asia were deeply concerned with things like marriage laws. The problem was in with Western women defining the nature of that problem and insisting that they alone have the solutions for it. Um, so that, that answers the Western side, I think, of your question, and then just kind of hinting at the, the non-Western side, which maybe we'll get to in other questions, is this very fact that there were women from other parts of the world who had the education, experience, and determination to challenge uh, sex, sexual discrimination and um, customs and laws uh, in their own countries and were beginning to voice those concerns very, very openly and on an international stage by the end of World War I. And do you think that those women um, uh, in Egypt and China, African-American women, saw themselves 
as um, allied in any way? Um, or were they um, fighting separate battles that were particular to their own context? <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, we talk a lot about um, the global south sometimes now, right, the kind of shared body of um, certainly political experiences and concerns from nations and citizens of nations that have experienced, uh, you know, forms of discrimination going back to the imperial order, you know, established in the 19th century and earlier. Um, I would say that kind of a common identity and a common sense of, uh, of a shared I, I, um, agenda was really just taking form in this moment. Um, I mean, in 1919 itself, where my book is primarily focused, we see, for example, the American um, suffragist and civil rights activist, Mary Church Terrell, who traveled to Europe in 1919 as a member of the American delegation to this uh, women's peace and, and women's rights conference in Zurich. And uh, when she got there, she realized that she was the only woman of color to have been invited as a delegate by any nation in the world. And when I say that, it's not that she saw herself only as the only African-American or the only person from the African diaspora, but she says there were no other women there from, um, from India or from China or from Japan. And so in, in making that claim, she, she was kind of stating indirectly, I'm, I probably have something in common with some of these women, <laughs> and yet they're not here either. And if anyone is going to express the concerns of any women other than white women from the West, for the most part, it's falling on my shoulders here now. So we see the very beginnings of this kind of common identity. We see strands of it elsewhere. So that, for example, the African American, well, the, I should say the civil rights um, newsletter of the NAACP, The Crisis, um, they're, uh, the, one of the female editors of that, uh, of that journal ran an article on the Egyptian women's participation in the Egyptian revolution of 1919, suggesting that her African-American readership had an interest in Egyptian women's rebellion against colonialism. And then um, later in the 1920s, the first Egyptian feminist newspaper um, published a kind of full page uh, story, feature story on Chinese feminist Sumei Chung when she became the first Chinese uh, female judge. Again, suggesting there's something common in this experience. We can, we can find inspiration in stories of women who are similarly situated in the world. Um, but it wouldn't be, it, w it was only in the 20s and 30s that we see actual organizations beginning to form um, that kind of circumvented the big international women's organizations that tended to be Western dominated and um, the kind of early efforts to seek to organize women from what we would now call the global South. I think one of the things that I found uh, most interesting about your book is in choosing 1919, which, you know, of course, we understand why it's a pivotal year at the end of the First World War or with the peace treaty and, and so forth. Um, but it also is a, it's, it is literally a pivot, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, we can see the past in it and we can also, as you just described, begin to see what's going to develop in the next couple decades, even if it's not completely formed yet. Um, uh, so I want to ask you about another topic which is very familiar to the two of us, I think, as French historians, which is the kind of um, contradiction or paradox um, between women demanding equality and women asserting difference, particularly their role as mothers. And uh, that's a big topic, of course, in um, uh, French history, uh, particularly at the end of the 19th, the beginning of the 20th century, and then of course into the 1920s when the French are very frightened about their dropping birth rate, only exacer exacerbated by the First World War, uh, in which, you know, motherhood is a national um, uh, priority, even among feminists, um, although they define it differently perhaps than um, uh, many uh, male conservatives do. Um, but it comes up a number of times in your book, right? Not just among, uh, among French women, actually, or French uh, feminists. So um, can you talk a little bit about the different arguments that are used and 
um, if they are in fact contradictory or whether the uh, women themselves see them as, uh, you know, as, as um, not contradictory. Yeah, good, great question. Um, so, you know, suffragists and feminists almost everywhere in the world, I would say, have had to confront the problem that um, ultimately winning suffrage and winning women's rights is a battle of persuasion, right? You need to persuade, again, those who have the power that your participation matters or that your rights matter. And so that immediately evokes the question of why, and it also evokes the question of strategy. You know, why should women have these rights? And then strategically, what is the best way to convince those people, i.e. men, that it is in everybody's collective interest to, um, to you know, foster inequality, political equality and other kinds as well. And so this question of whether women should go into that argument emphasizing that they're equal to men that, or that they're even um, a, a kind of a clear way that they're individuals just like men and that therefore endowed with individual rights and there's no reason to deny that to them or whether they should go into those arguments arguing that they are different than men, but it's that very difference that uh, explains why it's so important for them to become equal and participate in national and international politics. And so we see these debates, as you said, come up again and again. They came up in the American context, context in the suffrage movement, and they come up internationally as well. Um, I'll give two examples from my book exa uh, for, to kind of get at the, spe the specifics and then maybe draw the broader case. So in the Western context, I think the most interesting um, one was a discussion that went back and forth in letters between French suffragist Marguerite de Witch Limberger, who was the um, head of the French, the largest French suffrage society at the time, and Millicent Garrett Fawcett, who was head of the largest British suffrage society at the time. And the two of them were writing back and forth. This was actually while World War I was still going on. Um, and they had already zeroed in on the idea that when the war ended, that the single most powerful man in the world was going to be Woodrow Wilson. And because you know America had entered the war and because uh, Wilson had uh, defined kind of a vision of the peace to come that no other global leader had. And so they were having this discussion back and forth about how can we get Woodrow Wilson to endorse the concept that women's rights need to be central to the new international global order and to international law. And in their letters, Schlumberger had initiated this and she more or less says, I think that we really need to write to Wilson and emphasize to him that women have sacrificed during World War I and they particularly as mothers have given their sons to this victory or to you know, what's going to be assumed was going to become a victory. And because of the sacrifice and service that they had earned um, the right, not just to national suffrage all over the world, but to a prominent place in this new international order. Um, now, Chalene Berger, I should say, is one of these French feminists who was also a pro-natalist and very geared, and she was also a mother to six children, and I forget how many grandchildren by that point in time. So um, these maternalist arguments came naturally to her, but she also was thinking strategically. Woodrow Wilson seems to be somebody who's warmed up to these arguments. Millicent Garrett Fawcett said, you know what? I've already seen it in World War I when we try and talk about women's suffering and sacrifice, they always lose out in these arguments because men's suffering and sacrifice in war when they're losing their lives in the trenches always trumps women. Mm -hmm. And so this is a losing argument, she more or less said, and what we really need to emphasize is women's indiv individual rights as, as individuals. And in the end, the letter they wrote kind of use both strategies at the same time. But what I love about this discussion is how straightforward they were. You know, usually they don't say out in the open, you know, what argument is going to work the best. Mm -hmm. And yet here these two women were having this conversation and um, kind of took a, a compromise position in the middle. A very different type of example from my book that I think is similar looks at Chinese delegate Su Mei Chung, 
who was advocating uh, for um, kind of full national sovereignty and full economic independence for China at the same time that she was self-consciously representing Chinese women in Paris in 1919. And she um, kind of emphasized two different things when she, because uh, she was the official Chinese spokesperson with the press. So, you know, in these interviews with Western media. On the one hand, she emphasized China's long um, history of peace and pacifism and trying to put it forward as a, a necessary pillar in a global order that sought peace. On the other hand, because she insisted that women's rights and women's liberation were central to China's ability to now take on a role in this world order, she also emphasized the fact that women, powerful women in China had been rising to positions of power for ages. And the specific figure that she made references back to was Mulan, right? The idea that women warriors, uh, legendary or true, you know, had led armies and served as ministers um, in the past and that China um, was prepared to see women do that again. So different versions though of an argument kind of stressing different sides of women's nature and trying to use them strategically in order to position oneself uh, to claim the rights that they wanted. I think it's interesting just because I've often, you know, the in the French case, of course, the line between strategy and uh, belief, I think, has always been um, uh, a little blurred, right? That French women also could be natalists, right? Um, as well as um, uh, as well as realizing that that was a strategy that could maybe um, uh, you know sort of break into uh, men's thinking on this topic. Yeah. So it's fascinating that you actually found it in the letters. <laughs> I mean, the other, I, I don't know how much time we have to talk about this question. I mean, the other really interesting case where this comes up is pacifist women um, who had largely gathered in Zurich in this moment in time, who were insisting in not just on women's rights, but they were more or less saying, if we follow the kind of male vision of a peace, which had already been kind of announced in the preliminary draft of the Versailles Treaty, they said, we're going to find ourselves at war again, which of course is exactly what happened, right? World War I gave way to World War II. Um, and the, but part of their argument was you need to fully include women in the peace negotiations and in the reconstruction of the world to come uh, because women are more peace loving than men. And they just directly made that assertion, sometimes strategically, but I think they really believed it as well. Mm -hmm. And yet that often, unfortunately, backfired for them because for the global statesmen who were still kind of hard-nosed realists when it came to diplomatic negotiation, saw these women as too peace-loving to be trusted with peacemaking, right? Because they wouldn't stand up for um, matters of interest to their own nations. It would give away too much. And so um, again, that, that kind of strategic versus heartfelt uh, question came out in their debates as well. Well, and I think one of the interesting things here, I mean, we're talking about how to convince men, the power brokers, the power negotiators, the, the holders of power. And then there's also the sense, I mean, women themselves sometimes had to come to this project. They could think different things at different moments in their life. They could think multiple things at once. Mm -hmm. Some women sort of had political realizations um, as they got older or they encountered new kinds of situations. And what I really loved about your book is what a kind of full portrait of these women come through. I mean, that's one of the strengths of these kinds of comparative biographies that each one of your chapters focuses on a small group of women. And we see that sometimes they were sort of, had been political for a long time and they had this strategy like the French feminists and they're organized and they're writing about it and poor Woodrow Wilson, you know, he didn't know what was coming for him. And then sometimes it was much more kind of um, personal, intimate, individual um, experiences that kind of awakened them to this activism. And I'm thinking in particular, um, your chapter where you talk about um, uh, Huda Shawarwi and, um, yeah, thank you, and Sumei Cheng. Um, and they, both of them 
had arranged marriages that they weren't happy with. And I think, in fact, Sumei Cheng sabotages her arranged marriage in what is kind of a really wonderful story. <laughs> um, and then some of their political actions, some of their political awakenings happen in things like department stores and women's magazines and salons that are organized inside of a home. I mean, it's, and I, I wonder, we have a panel for the Constitution Day in the 60s where we debated the personal is political slogan and what that means and how it's come to be misinterpreted um, in this age of consumerism. But anyways, that's a long-winded intro. If you could tell us a little bit about these, some of these women, how did they come to, uh, to become politicized and, um, and what events in their own life really helped them to understand on a structural level the ways in which women were disempowered and disenfranchised? Yeah, so actually the two women who you point to in particular from my book are both really good examples of ways in which um, the personal was very much political and also very much at the origin point of um, first feminist consciousness mm -hmm. among these women and then eventually feminist activism and organizing. So Hoda Shirawi is the first woman you mentioned there who played a leadership role in the women's protests in the midst of the Egyptian revolution of 1919. This was a revolt against British colonialism and uh, in seeking to establish an independent sovereign state in Egypt. Um, but she also became the one of, well, the founder and the first president of the first Egyptian feminist uh, organization. Uh, Hoda Shirawi was from an extremely wealthy family. Her father was a, um, a big landowner, and um, um, so she grew up uh, very much with all the benefits of being a member of the elite, uh, economic benefits, but all of the restrictions that came with that for young women, because um, girls and then women of the elite had the privilege of being able to be protected in a very secluded domestic environment. This is where the concept of the harem comes from, um, that women uh, can be, um, of the elite, can be protected from the male gaze and live out much of their lives within this domestic space. Hoda Shirawi uh, was unhappy from a very early age that this had kind of been chosen as her destiny for her. Um, she had some access to education because there was a tutor who came to the home and um, taught her brother lessons and she was allowed to sit in on them up to a point. Mm -hmm. But when it came to a subject matter like Arabic, for example, she loved Arabic poetry. She wanted to kind of study Arabic grammar and literature. She had memorized the Quran at, at a young age. Um, but by about the age 10 or so, she was not allowed to study Arabic anymore because, you know, as her ser the servant overseeing her education said, you know, you're not going to become a scholar or a judge, so why do you need advanced Arabic? And in fact, she ended up learning, as many girls in her class did, learning French better, written French, better than she learned Arabic because foreign tutors could still come to the house and tutor her where she couldn't learn her own language as well. So she had resentments about um, restrictions on her education very early on. And then um, at age 13, her uh, mother con you know, essentially contracted for her to marry a much older cousin. He was already in his 40s and um, had a wife and children of his own. Uh, the purpose for this marriage was to keep the fortune, the vast fortune in the family. And um, while, you know, marriages between young women and older men were not uncommon, not just in Egypt, but in many parts of the world in this era, um, uh, Hoda Shirawi deeply resented it and saw it as a real restriction on her, on her own freedom. For complicated reasons I won't go into here, she managed to actually become um, kind of separated from her husband for about a seven year period, which allowed her to grow up in relative independence, continue her own education, embark on philanthropic projects, and eventually um, start to take place in this discussion in women's magazines and in women's salons that with the help of women like her was getting off the ground in Egypt where they began exploring kind of the origins of what they considered to be restrictions on their lives that they did not accept as natural, as normal, or as even um, traditional mm 
uh, within Muslim or Arab culture. And so they you know, began looking for um, alternative sources of tradition that they might turn to to emphasize a female equality. So that's her personal story and you know, it goes on, it's equally interesting from there. Sumei Chung uh, in China, um, in some respects had uh, some similar experiences. She too was from an extremely wealthy family in Southern China, also destined for a fairly domestic life. Um, her rebellion, she attributes a lot to her mother. Um, her mother was only 20 some years older than her, but kind of a full generation removed from uh, inexperience and possibility. And her mother um, had bound feet, and so she was hobbled her entire life. She had been um, kind of forced into an arranged marriage with Chen's father, who um, Chen loved, but he also had a concubine and had another family, and um, that left her mother very despairing at points in her life. Um, Chung knew that her mom had contemplated suicide, which was often one of the few outs for women of the elite. And so um, uh, Chung's rebellion in, in part stemmed from her mother and her experience. Uh, she talks about her mother reading the Mulan story to her as a young child and telling her, look, there are women in our history who have not accepted this kind of um, you know, tradition bound idea of what women can be. You go out and make your, your own life. And so her mother defended her at some key moments in, in her childhood, including when she at a very young age refused to have her own feet bound. So her older sister had bound feet, but she did not. And then uh, when the family essentially arranged a marriage um, that Chung uh, rejected, the, the young man she was supposed to marry purportedly did not believe in educating women. Uh, he was from a family that didn't think you should have telephones because that encouraged too much communication with the outside. And so she was hearing all this about this man she was supposed to marry. And so uh, she wrote him a letter and said, you know what, I don't think we're particularly well suited. Why don't you go find yourself your own, uh, find a wife that would make you happier than me. Um, I, I wanna go educate myself. And this caused a scandal like you cannot even imagine. In fact, her family you know, kind of moved her out of Southern China, sent her off to an American missionary school for a while. And eventually when she got involved in uh, revolutionary politics, uh, eventually shipped her off to Paris to get her out of harm's way. So um, these were women who were, you know, exceptional, although not, uh, not, well, I should say they were extraordinary, but not exceptional. Mm -hmm. There were other women um, experiencing similar awakening and similar forms of rebellion at the same time, and who were prepared to act on it by 1919, and of course, in the decades that followed. So another fascinating aspect of your book, I think, is the way you can link these biographies to larger groups um, of women and also men uh, that are fighting for um, uh, various causes. And since we're talking about uh, Sumei Cheng, I just wanted to ask you, it seems like the Chinese um, group of revolutionary nationalists are among the few who actually support women's uh, emancipation in marked contrast to the power brokers in Europe and the United States, uh, where the persuasion that you've talked about really, you know, had to come into to play. And also in Egypt, where uh, Egyptian men, although many of them were also revolutionary nationalists, had a pretty traditional um, uh, view of gender role. So what made China different? What's, why is women's emancipation um, on the agenda of the revolutionaries there? So China was in this kind of unique position um, in the early 20th century, and particularly right at the end of World War I, in that it had just undergone an internal revolution, a revolt against the Qing dynasty, uh, the last dynasty in China. Um, and also was fighting at least a form of economic imperialism that had stripped China um, of a lot of its um, control over its own economics and foreign policy that had come from imperial incursions going back into the 19th century. And so at this moment in time, as, as China was trying to establish its place as a global powerhouse all over again, it was also um, very much staging a rejection against its own culture, its own traditions and its own culture that from within, 
that wasn't from um, coming from the outside. And one of the targets that these young nationalists, mostly men, but now increasingly women too, uh, one of the targets of their rebellion was against Confucianism that had mandated you know, for centuries all kinds of different um, hierarchies in society. You know, the, the young respect their elders, um, but that also um, made women inferior in status and in rights to men. And so this rejection of Confucianism, or at least serious challenge to Confucianism, that was part of this uh, nationalist revolt against the Qing Dynasty and against imperialism, also got wrapped up in the idea of what kind of sovereign Chinese state they wanted to form. And so um, there's a number of Chinese nationalist men who took up the cause of women's rights. Um, two uh, examples, a man by the name of Hu Xie, who um, uh, was a very prominent uh, intellectual at the time. He both um, uh, publicized and tried to make known um, uh, Heinrich Ibsen's famous play, A Doll's House mm. in China, um, using that as a lever for challenging women's subordination in the family. And he actually wrote his own kind of Chinese version of the story that was widely played on like on college campuses uh, right at the end of World War I. Um, so that's one example. Another example that probably everybody watching this has heard of is Mao Zedong, who was a young revolutionary, um, you know, leaning towards communism uh, at the time, but who also um, took up the cause of young women who were um, choosing suicide over a subordinate role in the society. And so there was a lot of discussion about women's rights and about gender equality among men as well as among women like Su Mei Chung, who were super active in this early nationalist movement. What Chinese feminist historians have tried to have often emphasized though, is that while there was a lot of interest in the issue um, among nationalist men, it seldom came with follow through and the desire to empower women equally with themselves and that it really fell to Chinese feminists, um, suffragists and feminists of different sorts to you know, repeatedly uh, challenge these men as they did um, in the United States and the suffrage movement and everywhere else, insisting that um, this wasn't just a matter of men liberating women, but this was a matter of women's full equal participation in drafting uh, the, the, the codes of law and traditions that would be the basis of this new Chinese order. And of course, Sumei Cheng becomes the first woman judge in China, right? Yep, she's the first female lawyer, first of all. Um, and uh, uh, she, uh, she starts a practice with a fellow law student, a Chinese, she had met him um, as a fellow Chinese exchange student in Paris studying law. They came back to China, opened up this practice together, and then later, after they shut down their practice, married. Um, but uh, in this, pra this legal practice, they defended a lot of um, women in some of the earliest modern divorce cases in China. And then what's really you know, so interesting is that she, um, she was very, very closely tied into the hierarchy of the Kuomintang, the nationalist party in China. And so in 19, um, the late 1920s and early 1930s, when they formed a committee to draft a legal code, a civil code, for the new Chinese society, she was one of five members that were, um, you know, asked to draft this code. And um, uh, political equality was kind of established on a different um, chain or whatever, but women's legal equality in marriage, which was so emphasized in this document, uh, was in no small part uh, because of Sumei Chang's um, legal expertise uh, that she brought into that discussion. And um, there, you know, there are histories, legal histories um, in China that talk a little bit about her uh, role in all of this. But Su Mei Chang uh, and her husband both were prominent nationalists, but they did not become communists. And so her history uh, has really been erased in China and hence been erased in a lot of kind of international histories of feminism too, and is only just now being rediscovered. Mm. 
Well, one of the things that I, I just think is so, it's, we always try and tell our students, right, that history is hard because one of the things to remember is that 1919 is this incredibly radical year where people are really thinking about new ways of organizing politics and society all over the world. I mean, we haven't sort of even really talked about Bolshevism, right, which is another kind of whole revolution that's happening um, in these years. And yet we as historians also know that World War II comes. Right, they didn't know that, but we know that it comes. And so there's, I mean, what's interesting about your book is all of this hope and promise, and then trying to square that a lot of these gains are rolled back or delayed. I mean, French feminists have to wait until after World War II to get the vote. Um, and, uh, and, and so one of the things when I was reading your book, and I'm gonna actually quote here from chapter one, so everybody bear with me for a second, but you write, um, you're talking about the French feminists, you say their central message was straightforward and unwavering, a stable and democratic world order depended on women's political enfranchisement and a lasting peace hung on international recognition of women's fundamental rights in the home, the economy and society. And I just kept hearing Hillary Clinton in the back of my head, women's rights are human rights and human rights are women's rights. And I think there she was in front of a new international body, the United Nations, making this argument that feminists had made in 1919. And so I guess, you know, without kind of putting too much pressure on this last question and for you to sum this all up, but what happened? How far have we come? You know, do we really think that, do we, have we still built this new democratic order on a world without full and equal participation of women as partners in building it? It's such an interesting question, and it's really kind of an interesting one to pose this week in particular, um, because in addition to all the other you know commemorations that have gone on and, and the commemoration of the 19th Amendment, um, this year and this month marks the 25th anniversary since the um, Beijing platform uh, was adopted. This was part of the World Conference on Women. This is where uh, Hillary Clinton made that famous speech now that women's rights are human rights. And so there's been a lot of stock taking just very, very recently about what this means for women's rights on a global agenda. And UN Women, which has become the kind of um, branch of the UN dedicated to uh, both studying uh, women's discrimination around the world, but forwarding policy objectives to address that. Um, UN Women uh, released a report just this week, uh, essentially saying we're seeing regression all over the world um, when it comes to gender equality. It's not just that we've held the line or whatever, but we're actually seeing, um, seeing reason to believe that rights won are be being taken away. And so, I mean, part, it's interesting. On the one hand, my book is such a narrow study, right? Temporarily, it's this really narrow study of one year. On the other hand, it is a constant reminder that battles are never just won, rights achieved, and we all go home happily ever after. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. wipe, wipe our hands with it and move on. Um, and these women were very well aware of that. They were happy to celebrate the achievements that they did make. So, you know, I talk in my book about the fact that women's intensive lobbying at the time of the Paris Peace Conference resulted in the fact that one of the founding articles of the League of Nations, which again is the predecessor to the United Nations, stated flat out that all positions at the League were open to men and women on an equal basis. That was revolutionary at the time. And women celebrated that as a sign that, okay, if at the international level, women are going to be accorded that level of equality, well, then it's going to follow at the national level everywhere as well. Um, but, uh, you know, the act, what actually happened, you know, a few women in the League of Nations gained chunks of power. Uh, women were hired in decent numbers to be secretaries and translators, but seldom hired into high level secretariat positions. And at the same time, women gradually have achieved the right to suffrage in most parts of the world today, but that hasn't followed with equal access or equal um, numbers of women serving as legislators or as heads of state or equal representation at the international level as well. Mm -hmm. 
And so, you know, one of the, I'd say the primary call that bound all these women together, despite all their differences in 1919, is that women have to be given a voice, they have to be seated at the table, they have to be able to participate in order to uh, change uh, the system, right? No matter what about that system needs to be fixing, or needs to be fixed. Um, and, you know, I, uh, I just listened in yesterday to a kind of retrospective on Beijing that um, featured Madeleine Albright and Hillary Clinton, and they were still saying the same thing, right? We've got to get women to the table, to every table at the national and international level. And then beyond that, of course, we need specific policy objectives um, that will address inequal ongoing inequalities and concerns. But the first step is to get women in, the, in a place where they can voice their concerns. And that, you know, we've bridged 100 years of time, but we're still making that same argument today. Well, that's a, a, a good note. I mean, it is a note to end on. I wish it were a little bit more hopeful. <laughs> but yes, thank you. Absolutely. I appreciate that. So um, thank you to Sarah and to Mona for joining us today for this conversation. Again, Mona's book is Peace on Our Terms. And it's really, a, it's a fantastic academic book, but it's also just a really fun book to read about an interesting group of women who live just amazing lives. Um, in 1919 and shows that the suffrage struggle was not only international, but also intersectional, um, which I think is the, the theme to this conference as well. So thank you both for joining us. Thank you so much for inviting me.